we're going to jump straight into our, our third panel. Our third panel is going to cover foreign policy and human rights, a call for consistency. U.S. foreign policy has been a contentious issue for American Muslims and those concerned with human rights. The sentiments of Muslim voters are influenced by the U.S. government's selective human rights agenda and historical approach towards Muslim-majority countries, particularly regarding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This panel discussion will delve into the various missteps made by U.S. government and its foreign policy, examining the consequences of these actions in the Muslim world and beyond. The aim is to explore alternative approaches that can help the United States regain its standing as a democratic world leader, one that upholds the principles of justice, human rights, and equality for all. As a quick reminder, if you have questions, please write them early. We'll have people collect them to hand to our moderate, moderator, Salam El Mariati, who is the co-founder uh, and president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank uh, Petro Sufi for teaching me not to read introductions uh, so that we can save time. Uh, and so I'm not going to read introductions. Good. Uh, I'm going to just simply uh, uh, highlight who, who these uh, wonderful uh, panelists are. Our first is uh, from the right to left. No, mm. from left to right is Wala Zayat is CEO of Engage, where he provides strategic and operational guidance and management for the organization. Uh, Josh Paul, who resigned from the State Department, uh, probably one of the first people to resign uh, from the State Department in October 2023, due to his disagreement with the Biden administration's decision to rush lethal military assistance to Israel in the context of its war on Gaza. And Tuka Nuserat is the executive director at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, where she is responsible for the institution's overall leadership, representation, strategy, and growth. And so, the Congressman joining us now. He's going to get mic. And Congressman so Rohan is here. Move Thank ahead. you, Congressman, for joining us. He's a representative of the 17th District uh, in California uh, and is a leading progressive voice in the House working to restore American manufacturing and technology leadership, improve the lives of working people, and advance U.S. leadership on climate, human rights, and diplomacy around the world. Welcome our panelists who are with us now. So we're going to get right to the, to the questions. Um, and we're going to gener uh, hopefully generate more questions uh, as, we, as we go. Um, all of a sudden, everyone wants to take a picture. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they all want to put it on my TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> we saw your TikTok the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for not attending the Netanyahu uh, parade coming to uh, Washington. Yes. Soon. So thank you for that. Yes. Um, I think mm. the, the first question is on the issue of, of human rights. Um, human rights is, is, is a term that you know, was established, I believe, under the Carter administration, where it was actually codified, where the State Department had to report uh, on human rights. But it's also something that is selective. Sometimes we apply human rights to, to a situation that may end up going to war or sanctions on people, and sometimes we turn a blind eye to human rights. So does human rights have any value uh, today in U.S. policy? We'll just go right, right down. Oh, OK. Um, salam, everyone. Um, just for your background, I worked at the State Department for 10 years on Middle East policy before I became the CEO of Engage. Um, and so uh, my observation is that uh, human rights matters to some people in the US government. And it matters differently. Uh, policy is really a, ref a reflection of people's policy, uh, people's values and views. Um, there are codified rules and regulations, right? You hear about Leahy law and other US domestic laws that govern, for example, US provision of, uh, let's say, military support to countries. And that they must ensure that it's not uh, being used to violate human rights or international law. Uh, so we have those on the books. These are laws and, 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 and uh, regulations. But what I'm talking about more is policy. Uh, and policy is people, right? And so what values do they bring to their decision making? And what I've 
you know, my takeaway is that, yes, human rights matters, but it matters less and less and less the higher you move up in the decision-making chain, and it means different things regarding different populations. Uh, as we were seeing before us, uh, an Israeli human right, a Ukrainian human right, is not equal to an Arab or a Muslim human right. I would even venture to say it's not equal to an African or a black human right, or a Latino human right. And, and to be brief, what is the answer to that then? There's a lot of ways to approach that. But that means you need values-based representation, not just representation, but values-based representation. That means you need individuals who, whether they are on policy committees, let's say, human, you know, the House Foreign Affairs Committee or Senate Foreign Relations Committee, or in an administration, whether at the National Security Council, the State Department, uh, Department of Defense, who value the importance of human rights. And they think of it not just as a nice to have, but as a strategic imperative that neglecting it, let alone undermining it, leads to secondary and tertiary effects down the line that strategically will harm us. Where if you neglect the atrocities of someone like Bashar al-Assad or the violations of Sisi or what Modi is doing in India or what Netanyahu is doing in Gaza or the West Bank, that will produce destabilizing effects, refugees outflows, radicalization, increased resorting to violence, that will essentially drag the US into another cycle of more wars, more spending, and more uh, even effects here on us domestically that you're seeing before us. Did anyone imagine what we're seeing on college campuses was gonna happen seven months ago? That's tearing up our society here. That's undermining our democracy here, our freedom of speech here because we're neglecting the human rights of the Palestinians. So it's not just that it was a nice thing to do, it's a strategic imperative for us here. And you need different people. You need different people, I can talk more about that. So it matters to some people, yeah. not the right people. Thank you. Um, you know, Congressman, you know, we've seen congressional hearings uh, on human rights, uh, and, and again, sometimes they're, 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 they're used selectively, they're ignored, in other areas, where do you see human rights uh, as a policy issue within this Congress, and um, and is there a way to rehabilitate that? Because it seems that, from our standpoint, there really is no concern for human rights when it comes to Muslims. Well, I can see why people feel that way with what has been going on uh, in the the brutal loss of life uh, in in Gaza. But human rights is foundational to the American story, founded on the Enlightenment. I mean, people often say when Immanuel Kant wrote Perpetual Peace, why is he writing something that may be so idealistic? But what Kant was imagining was a world where we would live up to our moral convictions, knowing full well that human beings are subject not just to reason and morality, but to greed and desire and challenges, but that we need to have a North Star to aspire to with our human frailty. And that has been the story of America, that we have the aspiration of what we should do, but that we haven't always lived up to that aspiration, either for the e equal rights within the United States or certainly uh, of those equal rights overseas. But as Wilde said, as we become a more multiracial, multicultural democracy, and as the younger generations point out that there is disparity in how we uh, stand up for these human rights and that there are narratives that we have ignored, Palestinian self-determination being one of them, and then uh, the, uh, the, the, the motion is there because of our founding principles for that to be realized. So we should not despair or disparage the ideals just because we have not lived up to those ideals. 
And the ideals are what gives hope for the type of political activism we need uh, to achieve uh, universal human rights in America to stand up for it. Thank you. Uh, Tuka, your, your organization does a lot of uh, studies uh, on issues. Does it address human rights and its impact on, uh, on American and U.S. foreign policy? Of course. I mean, I think what's most important is looking at um, how Americans in the U.S. most recently viewed what's happening in the conflict in, in Gaza and how um, what they feel about ceasefire, what they feel about um, U.S. weapons to be sent to Israel. Um, over 50 percent of young people in America, according to our most recent poll, um, were against uh, military, more military aid to Israel or felt that it was too much. Um, I think what, you know, the Biden administration came in saying that human rights is a priority. And unfortunately, the rest of the world is seeing that there's a gap between our words and actions. And if we want to have any um, credibility in pursuing the values that we are championing um, in Ukraine and in other parts of the world, we have to align our values with our actions um, and our words with our actions. Uh, what, when people see uh, the administration condemn the occupation of Russia and the targeting mm -hmm. of hospitals in Ukraine, they see um, at the same time the hospitals in uh, Gaza being targeted indiscriminately. And uh, that means that we are being seen in a way that we're not consistent with um, our, our approach to human rights, our approach to uh, how we view um, the values that we are projecting to the rest of the world, and that impacts our national security and our soft power. Thank you. Uh, Josh, you know, you, you worked in the State Department. There's a report that comes out every year on human rights through the mm -hmm. Depar uh, Democracy, uh, Human Rights, and Labor uh, Division. Um, and uh, we have people who work there. But as, uh, to Wiles' point, as you get higher and higher you know, in the echelon in the State Department to the Secretary himself, does that really m mean anything? I mean, I honestly think that at one level it does. Um, you know, just to back up for a second, I think on this broader question of human rights, uh, and to the Congressman's point, I think the opposite of human rights is dehumanization. Uh, and that is a coupling we see again and again in our own American history. Uh, when we look at how America has treated African Americans, when we look at how it has treated uh, indigenous uh, peoples, uh, and it's something we see uh, very vividly right now in the context of Palestine, uh, but also in the context of Muslim communities around the world from the American foreign policy perspective, uh, where there is a, first of all, a, in, in, in essence, before you even get to the question of human rights, there is first of all a dehumanization that is baked into our thinking um, so that when those violations then occur, we, we fail to address them as vividly as we would, for example, in the context of Ukraine, uh, because of that dehumanization. Um, I also think that there is a sort of reinforcing mechanism here. Um, and I think you also see this currently in the Middle East, uh, with regards to US policy to the Middle East, where um, there are human rights violations that are occurring. Uh, we refuse to recognize them. And because of that, we then find ourselves doubling down on autocracies because our positions put us in opposition to the thoughts, the feelings, the ideals, the beliefs of the vast majorities of populations across the Middle East, we find ourselves increasingly compelled, or at least I think that's how the administration sees it, uh, to double down on our support to autocracies that will repress uh, those thoughts and those feelings and that opposition to our thinking, which only then increases opposition to the US, and it is a sort of self-reinforcing cycle um, that again begins with dehumanization and begins with a willingness to have a double standard uh, when it comes to human rights. And, and I do agree with everyone here uh, who has said that that double standard is deeply damaging, uh, of course, primarily to those who are affected, for example, in Gaza right now, but also to American national security. Um, we are contributing to a world right now uh, that essentially rips apart the uh, post-World War II efforts to establish an international you know, rules-based international order, as Secretary Blinken so often calls it. And at the end of the day, uh, that will result in a world of chaos. That takes us back to a, a pre-World War I moment where mm. might is right uh, and will be incredibly dangerous, an incredibly da dangerous world uh, for all of us. And then finally, to your point at the State Department, I mean, look, I think people, everyone, I, th I do think, in the State Department, up to the Secretary, including the Secretary, comes into office uh, with a, a belief uh, in the importance of human rights. 
Uh, I think different people may see that differently, but I would say even under the Trump administration, senior officials there did have within themselves a confidence that they believed in human rights. I think the question is a much more personal one than that, and I think it is one that is tested uh, by the experience that, is, that you have, by the crises that you face. Uh, and I think what we discover is how true uh, that confidence, that belief is, and how much it reflects the real world in which we exist, as opposed to the world as you might think it was, or have thought it was, coming into office. And I think that's what we see now, that there is a world that many officials thought there was, and it is not, as we can all see, the world that actually exists. Thank you. Um, th th there's another policy initiative involving national security. And does national security compete with human rights? I mean, th these are two different fields, obviously. But does, you know, you hear administrations uh, invoke national security. National security was invoked to justify Japanese-American internment. It was invoked in the Gulf Wars. Uh, it was, it's invoked in, in the assault uh, of Gaza uh, that the president said we have to support Israel because of national security. What, what are we gaining from this national security policy, if anything, and what needs to be changed? Anyone? Start with you, Juan. I mean, I guess that depends philosophically whether you feel that uh, national security is distinct from human rights or it is part and parcel of it. So if it's, um, if you view it as the former, then there, it's always going to be competing with it and it will be relegated uh, to the fourth or fifth or sixth nice to have. But if you believe that, um, I mean, what is human right? It's treating people with dignity and then everything that, that, that fits under that. And so if you believe that you need to defend yourself from an enemy by executing their civilians and ill-treating their prisoners, then you need to re-examine your definition of national security. Uh, on moral grounds, on religious grounds, as well on strategic grounds. Because we, again, just heard that there are consequences to these violations. Um, and you don't have to be a student of history to understand how policies in the Arab world that are both fed by Western powers, but also Arab rulers, for example, gave us a lot of the extremism, radicalization, and terrorism that have come back and hurt those societies and the Western powers and their populations. So to me, human rights is absolutely central to both the understanding of national security and should be part and parcel of its application. And so when you look at a conflict like in Gaza or the broader Palestinian-Israeli one, the whole premise of, for example, the Abrahamic Accords was National security, actually. It is let us resolve this conflict between regional allies who are friends of the United States so we can confront China better. That's the premise. Oh, and by the way, we'll just bypass the Palestinians who have been occupied for 75 years. It'll take care of itself over time. It may be the peace dividend of what we're about to do here. If your theory of the case is I'm going to go ahead and partner with an occupying power and an absolute monarchy to confront another dictatorship, then number one, you don't understand history, you don't understand strategy, you don't understand people. And that neglect of the human rights of the Palestinians not only undermined their livelihood and has led us to October 7th, what we're seeing today, it has hurt the United States strategically. If I need to enumerate today why the United States is strategically weaker today vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis China, because of what we've done and what the world has seen. I mean, how can we go to any country today and ask them for stronger support for Ukraine? Sure, some European countries will go along. And by the way, the Ukraine people deserve all of our support. I want to be very clear about this. Russia must get out of Ukraine. But that undermines our strategy. How are we going to go and convince folks that we need to support Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis China? 
with the same vigor and, and conviction. People are already talking about the Chinese can just roll through the island in three days. And so there's been strategic consequences now. And again, what has happened here to our own American democracy. In my view, handing over this country back to Donald Trump will be heavily influenced by what happened in Gaza and is a strategic danger to our American democracy. But, um, well, wow, you, you've worked with the national security team. You know some of these people, McGurk and Feiner and, and these other folks. What do you, just be honest with us. What do you, what do you think of them? Why, why are, why, in, in, in many people's eyes, <laughs> this is the worst national security team we've ever had. American credibility is at an all-time low. Anti-American sentiment is at an all-time high throughout the world, not just in the Middle East, but everywhere. We're losing ground in terms of having any credibility. China is moving in to the Middle East. People are rushing to China for support. So this national security team, in many people's eyes, deserves an F. What do you, what do you think about First that? First of all, I will be, I don't want to dominate the conversation. There, there, there oh, I'm more sure interesting will, people, yeah. We'll have something to so say I'll, about it. So all I'll yeah. say is, is I appreciate how difficult these jobs are, how hard it is to do these jobs. These are loyal public servants. I want to be very clear about this, even those I disagree with. I do not at all question their integrity or their intentions. I don't. But remember what I said in the beginning, valued representation. With all due respect to the individuals you mentioned, they're all white men. I don't think any of them speaks Arabic. I don't think any of them has spent time in the region outside of their jobs. Do they know us? Do they care about us? Do they understand us? My answer is maybe, yani, <laughs> shwe. Really, let's be honest, right? It means just a little. If you don't know me and understand me, why are you going to care about me? Not to do the right things when it's easy, but when it's difficult. Difficult. And they avoid the difficult decisions because they are not us. That's all I'm going to say. Um, Congressman, uh, there's a distinction between domestic terrorism and foreign terrorism. Foreign ter terrorism designation allows the US government to investigate, surveil, uh, uh, put you on a watch list uh, it, you know, by mere suspicion or association. Um, domestic terrorism, there's no statute. Uh, and as the FBI said, they can't do anything about domestic terrorism until they commit a crime. So you can be put under the foreign terrorist designation uh, and be subjected to some of the most um, uh, draconian policies uh, that we, we've, we've seen since 9-11. The ADL has called for uh, students for justice, justice in Palestine, other Palestinian student groups to be investigated at, for quote unquote material support uh, of foreign terrorist organizations. That to us is very dangerous. It's it's basically calling for the national security apparatus to be unleashed on these students. And they've already, you know, we've seen how vilified they are already. Um, can you comment on that in terms of, you know, what Congress can do? Uh, I know it's under House, it's under Republican control now, but for, for people like yourself who are progressive and concerned about civil rights, civil liberties, uh, as well as human rights, uh, what, what can we do to uh, begin to mitigate that? Well, we need to speak out uh, clearly, and I have tried, as have some of my colleagues, many of my colleagues, to speak out in saying that uh, the student protesters today, uh, by and large, are in the tradition of the student protesters against Vietnam, the student protesters against apartheid, the student protesters for women's rights and gay rights, the student protesters against the Iraq war. That doesn't mean that the Gaza conflict is exactly parallel uh, to what happened in Vietnam, but it does mean that you have a new generation that is uh, finding its uh, political voice uh, in uh, opposition uh, to uh, what Netanyahu is doing in Gaza. And then to uh, criminalize that uh, or to, uh, to, to, to engage in the, the mass expulsion or mass suspension of uh, students for uh, exercising uh, their First Amendment rights is, is wrong. Uh, if there are 
students who have actually uh, engaged in uh, violence, obviously there has to be uh, accountability. I still don't think it rises to the level of uh, uh, throwing terrorism statues at them, but of course no one can condone uh, uh, violence. But uh, by and large, these pr protests uh, have not been violent, and one can say that we need to clearly and unambiguously condemn uh, any form of Islamophobia or actual anti-Semitism, which is not uh, conflated with the criticism of Netanyahu, but the actual incidents of Islamophobia or anti-Semitism, anti while recognizing uh, speech and uh, open speech. I always thought it was the conservatives who were complaining that uh, we're censoring mm -hmm. speech at, at universities. And the more people who sp speak uh, clearly about that, the better. But you know, I, I think that young people usually have the final say in this country, from uh, uh, the people who fueled Kennedy to Obama to Bernie, uh, and uh, we run the risk of being uh, out of touch with uh, young voters uh, in America if we're not uh, paying attention to what they're trying to tell us. You know, I, I thank you. Um, I, I visited uh, four encampments. They're all peaceful. Uh, Princeton did a study. 95% is peaceful. Uh, there's more vandalism against them. Yeah, against them. There's also more vandalism, harassment, assault after football games than there are, you know, hmm. around these encampments. Hmm. So, and we're not going to cancel football games. Um, so there's it's, it's that wouldn't be popular. Right? No, it's, it's, obviously. It's, it's, but it's just it's just ridiculous to call these encampments uh, violent or anti-Semitic when all when also a number of Jews are participating in these encampments. Uh, because, and not in our name is their, is, is their, uh, uh, their, their motto. Um, so, um, and I know in the Congress there's a big push now for more legislation on anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. but it basically conflates it with anti-Zionism, with criticism of the state of Israel. That's a violation of the First Amendment. If, if you're gonna violate the First Amendment of now, I don't know how many students, hundreds of thousands must be, uh, who, who, who are acting their conscience and saying, this is wrong, I don't want to be a part of this genocide anymore. And nobody's paying attention to them. And there's legislation that is coming down uh, to punish them even further. Uh, how, do we, how do we manage that? How do we reconcile that? Well, I voted no on the recent uh, bill on anti-Semitism precisely because I thought that the bill uh, would have suppressed criticism of the state of Israel or criticism of Netanyahu. And I believe that we need to be in this country open to criticizing our own government, our own members of Congress, whether it's or Israel or, or, or Hamas. But I, but I also think we have a, a responsibility to understand a distinction mm -hmm. between uh, the criticism of Israel, which should be allowed, and a real fear in this country, in my district, of increased incidents of Islamophobia and anti-Semitism yes, that are, are not uh, of the kind of pe people uh, who are uh, just criticizing uh, Netanyahu. They're of the kind that are calling students proxies for Hamas or proxies for Iran in the case of Islamophobia, mm, or they're mm. of the kind in the case of some Jewish students where they're spitting on the Star of David or saying, yeah. go back to Europe. And uh, I emphasize these when I go uh, to the AJC. I offered or ADL, if I was speaking, I would say, speak out louder against Islamophobia. And those uh, who are Muslim Americans need to speak out loudly and all of us against actual incidents of anti-Semitism so that we can recognize that we should have free dialogue in this country of respect, uh, but call out uh, the bigotry and hate uh, it, on, on all sides, and that, in my view, is, uh, is the way forward. Thank you. Uh, Tuka, uh, the, the administration has been talking about a campaign to fight Islamophobia. Has your organization looked mm -hmm. into some of the components of, of that campaign? What's acceptable? Because we hear from a lot of community members <laughs> that they, they think that that's just a, they're just throwing us a bone, uh, and it's not worth it. 
Yeah, I think it's important that, like I said, our, our words are aligned with our values and our actions and our policies. And I think it's unfair to um, bring up issues of Islamophobia in a vacuum um, while you're ignoring what people are saying. These policies are rooted in, in Islamophobia. They're rooted in a lack of understanding of the Muslim world and the Muslim community. Um, if you don't believe that Muslims deserve human rights, either here or abroad, that's, that's Islamophobic, and that's, that has serious consequences uh, on people in the U.S. And, and people, Muslims abroad as well. I think on the issue of, um, just want to touch on the issue of national security that mm -hmm. you brought up. You know, every country has, um, has the right to pursue its um, national interests. And in the U.S., um, that means having soft power in the region, that means having economic power in the region, that you're able to balance, uh, you know, geostrategic shifts and competition from Russia and China. Uh, when you are, when the United States government is putting itself, uh, throwing itself completely behind Israel in this situation, you have a huge economic boycott that is having visible impact on U.S. companies in the region. That impacts national security. When you have people, um, when you have America losing its soft power, you have diplomats in the region who are writing cables back to the State Department and saying, we have never seen this level of anti-American sentiment, not even right. in the Iraq war, and that we are losing a whole generation of Arabs um, who are no longer believing in U.S. values and who are saying, you know what, at least China doesn't lecture us about human rights when, um, when it, you know, it has its own uh, issues. And so we need to be mindful of, of how that, that is perceived um, in the Middle East and across the world. Thank you. Um, Josh, you know, you can look up the Office of the Director of National Intelligence on a State Department website, and it lists foreign terrorist organizations. 98% is Muslim. It does not designate Hindu terrorists, even though there was an assassination recently uh, in Canada, in, in Canada uh, against a Sikh, Sikh uh, uh, individual. Um, doesn't consider, I mean, I, I know that they've, they've listed a few uh, uh, Israeli settlers um, to sanction them, but doesn't list any uh, Jewish terrorist organization uh, out of the West Bank or anywhere from that region. Doesn't consider white supremacy as a transnational threat, even though we've seen white supremacist violence not just in the United States, but in New Zealand and mm -hmm. throughout Europe. Um, so it sure does look like the United States is singling out Islam, even though there's been denial after denial that this is not a war against Islam. Yet Al Qaeda uses that as a recruiting tool to say that the United States is at war with Islam. Um, Tell us how we can deconstruct that, how we can manage that. Yeah, I mean, I would offer one, one uh, observation on the list you just gave, uh, which is that until two years ago, the US did actually list uh, two Israeli organizations on the foreign terrorist organization list, Kach and Kahanachai, mm -hmm. uh, two West Bank-based uh, terrorist groups. Um, and it was this administration that delisted them. Um, and it was not clear to me at the time from within the State Department why suddenly there was a need to delist them. And in, indeed, uh, we have seen in the actions of these people associated with these groups uh, in the West Bank. And, and actually, if I recall, uh, there was someone in New York who is a descendant mm -hmm. of Rabbi Meir Kahano, who was the founder of those groups, uh, who attacked physically a group of protesters just in the last couple of months. Um, so I don't understand why that decision was made. I do agree with you. Uh, that there is a clear bias within the lists when it comes to uh, organizations emanating out of the Middle East. Uh, you know, there have also historically been a couple of groups uh, out of Latin America that are, are not in any way Muslim-related, uh, Shining Path, Tubac Amaru, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think in part this is a product of US, the U.S.'s own adventurism uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it's in part, let's be honest, a reflection of the Cold War history uh, in which you had great power competition playing out significantly through uh, terrorist activities that were conducted by various groups in Europe and in the Middle East. Um, but I don't think it's a useful tool as it was in thinking about how we frame the world today. Terrorism is certainly international terrorism, transnational terrorism is certainly a threat, it's certainly a crime. Um, but it's not, I don't think, going to define the coming generation of national security concerns in the way it has defined the last one. 
uh, we are in an era, I think the Biden administration rightly acknowledges, uh, of strategic competition. Um, and in that competition, it is our values, and it is a competition over values, over, um, you know, democracy versus, you know, authoritarianism. Uh, it's a competition between systems in which you can have uh, capitalism without freedoms versus those in which you can have free markets, but regulated free markets, and freedoms. Um, and to the extent that we keep falling back on those same tropes and those same, I think, misfocuses, we will miss the big picture again and again. And I think going back to what Wael was saying, that's part of the problem with the current national security team. Uh, in part, yes, it's that they haven't, you know, lived on the ground in the Middle East. Uh, and, and, you know, if you look at, I mean, you know, I mean, President Biden, of course, has been in the Senate for the last 40 years before becoming vice president under Obama. Uh, you know, Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken was staff director on Senate Foreign Relations Committee. This is not in any way a hit on Congress. Um, but it, is, it does mean that they ha you have a lot of people there who have not spent a lot of time in the region. But I think really the issue is that their theory of the case is wrong and that they are sitting in Washington right. playing great power politics. And isn't the world just a great game of risk? and we will keep rolling the dice, and we will keep coming out on top because we're America, uh, rather than recognizing that the world is actually changing and that the things that worked during the Cold War and the post-Cold era, in a moment particularly of American hegemony, of alliances and partnerships, are, are certainly still important, but they are not the only thing that is important. And in an increasingly interconnected world, in a world where people around the globe have access to social media, don't only get their news from one source, uh, in a people where there is greater transparency because of that social media, how we act and whether we follow our, follow our values is probably the most important tool that we have as America and the most important advantage that we have. Uh, and yet they seem to be leaving that aside to play this game of geopolitical risk. And I think that's where it's going wrong. Um, if, if, uh, if we define terrorism as the targeting of civilians with violence to achieve a political or military goal, then isn't bombing refugee camps, schools, hospitals, civilian populations, terrorism? And isn't Israel committing one of the worst acts of terrorism that we have seen in history? So, I mean, yes, I think, I think the one caveat I put on that is that historically, and of course it's nation states that get to define this, uh, nation states would take that definition, but they would add to it by non-state actors. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the definition well, of terrorism, let's say right? It's the use of political violence by non-state actors. But let's actors. say Iran did this. But, but I agree with you. No, yeah. I agree with you that, yeah. that, you know, the bombing of, so for example, you know, as it's been said explicitly by some IDF officers, part of the intent of Israel's tactics in Gaza uh, is essentially to try and, quote unquote, separate the population from Hamas by demonstrating the damage that Hamas is doing to the people of Gaza by bombing the people of Gaza. That is the use of political viol of, of violence for a political ends. That is the definition of terrorism. Of course, the United States has recently recognized uh, that nation states can conduct terrorism. We designated very mm -hmm. controversially under the Trump administration the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as a foreign terrorist organization. And that was controversial because that was the first time that we had designated a government entity uh, mm -hmm. as being a terrorist entity. But yes, I think it is clear that, that when governments use violence uh, indiscriminately and in order to achieve a political goal that is of course a form of terrorism and it is a form of trauma and traumatizing deliberately that will have lasting 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 emotional and psychological impacts on all those poor kids in Gaza uh, and and will be carried forward for generations That's right. um, do you have more questions or are you too sleepy after lunch so yeah oh good thank you all right just write your questions. You have, uh, yeah, ask for an uh, index card. All right, um, Josh, to you, resigning has a lot of power and impact the more senior you are. For those of us early in, our, or, in or entering our careers, how do we balance that impact? Don't resign. Uh, that impact us. Uh, staying in the room and affecting change internally. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you go into uh, any career uh, in order to resign from it, right? I mean, that, that's sort of not, not the, not the, the intent certainly wasn't my intent. I think you go into any career conscious of your own conscience, of your own red lines. Uh, I do think that, you know, part of advancing, uh, certainly in, in U.S. government, is making compromises uh, as you go and trying to understand where you can have an impact uh, versus, you know, where you just have to step away. 
uh, and that is a constant balancing act. And I'll, I'll be honest that you know my own thinking evolved over time. Um, you know, particularly impacted by you know having worked in Iraq, um, and you know I think if I was doing that at the end of my career rather than the beginning of my career, I might have made some very different choices uh, about staying in that context. Um, but I think there are immense opportunities to do good in government, uh, even in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs and the State Department, working on arms transfers, working on security assistance. Uh, you can do more good in some ways in one day than you can do in a lifetime outside of government. Um, but I think be conscious of, of you know, where your red lines are. Don't, if, you're, if your red lines are there, don't go and work for the Bureau of Political Military Affairs. Go and work for the Human Rights Bureau. Go and work for the Bureau of Oceans and Environmental Science. Uh, as I say, there are plenty of opportunities to do good, but just uh, you know, keep in mind what your limits are and, and be prepared to stand up for them whatever level you're at. Um, to the Congressman, uh, how do you think limiting the influence of money in politics and antitrust uh, politics better our foreign policy? Sorry. Limit influence of yeah, money just, in politics. Uh, me, uh, limit the influence of money in politics that would influence foreign policy. And I think it's referring to AIPAC. <laughs> well, I, I'm one of uh, 10 members of Congress who doesn't take any PAC money. And I've said that we need to ban PACs and we need to ban super PACs. But, <laughs> but beyond the uh, banning, which is uh, required by Congress, and the, uh, and, and the banning of super PACs, which would require uh, overturning Citizens United, the Democratic Party, at the very least, should take a clear line that no super PACs should be allowed to come into Democratic primaries. We can't uh, unilaterally disarm in a presidential election when you have super PACs on the other side. But we certainly could take the position that the DNC will endorse against any candidate where you have super PACs of any uh, mm -hmm. persuasion coming in. And what we see right now yeah. of super PAC spending targeted particularly uh, against people of color and women of color uh, who have stood up uh, for human rights in Gaza is a very sad uh, statement for the Democratic Party because yeah. it's actually uh, hurting our ability to mobilize uh, the base that we're going to need for the president's reelection. I'm a little hesitant to ask this, but and you mm -hmm. don't have to raise your hand. But if you, if you will, how many people here are planning for sure for voting for President Biden in November? How many are undecided? And how many are a definite no? I mean, you know, you don't have to That's do bad. polling. Yeah. You don't have to do polling to know we've got a challenge. Yeah. What By is the it? way, how many of you voted for President Biden in 2020? You know, wow. I mean, yeah, so, yeah, if there was media covering this, I don't know if there is or not, but they, there's your focus group. There's right your here. focus group. Yeah. Because this is a, these are informed voters. These aren't the folks who are mm -hmm. making my TikToks go viral. Maybe some of them are, but these are, <laughs> the, the, these are people who are, you know, in, you want to have a career in pop, public life. Yes. I mean, doesn't uh, wow. like 54% of Democrats feel that Biden needs to be replaced on the ticket? <laughs> well, look, that, that, that's not. <laughs> That, that's not practical uh, for, for a number of reasons. One, you know, you, when you look at people who came out of nowhere, Bill Clinton or Jimmy Carter or Barack Obama, they, they, they spent a year winning primaries and earning the respect and, 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 and recognition of the American public. And, uh, and absent the Michelle Obama, who, who's not going to run, you don't have someone who has the branding and the name ID uh, to take on Donald Trump, who has universal name ID. So, uh, you know, the, the focus has to be how do we get the uh, administration yeah. to, to, to change. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad finally that there has been a peace plan calling for a permanent ceasefire, but there also have to be some sticks. And to me, the, 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 you know, the, what I said, because someone, we, we were, I was having a conversation about uh, Netanyahu coming and why I said I'm not going to attend. And someone said, Ro, you're always for dialogue. You're always for... Uh, having a conversation with people. And I, I said, I'm perfectly happy if you want to invite the, the prime minister to have a conversation with the Progressive Caucus, and I'll tell him <laughs> exactly what I think. But I'm not going to sit there and be lectured by him in uh, a one-way conversation. That's not, that's not a conversation. Yeah. Uh, and, an honor. Uh, and so, you know, we need to, uh, the, the, the president, 
has gotten to the point of, okay, there's a vision for permanent ceasefire, but there have to be now sticks on uh, offensive weapons with the red line mm -hmm. in Rafa. There has to be a, a, a willingness to say no more offensive weapons. There has to be a willingness to, uh, to, to criticize uh, giving someone a, a, universe, a uniform platform when you're, you yourself are saying that he's out there trying to uh, sabotage your reelection. Yeah, no, just to add on what the Congress said, I mean, you're really seeing gross distortion of U.S. foreign policy through what APAC and DMFI are doing in Democratic primaries. Is that succinct enough? Mm -hmm. It's gross distortion of our foreign policy because they found a way to target members of Congress who are, I think, all black. Think about this. This, this should be a scandal. Um, to defeat them or try to defeat them in primaries and replace them with compliant and pliant Democrats who might be great on all kind of other issues, but they just have to be allied with them on their right-wing vision for Israel. And, and they are targeting anyone who has not only not been good enough on Israel, who has shown any humanity toward the Palestinians because they want to teach all of us a lesson, and all members of Congress a lesson, that if you dare oppose us, we're going to get rid of you, right? And this is the intersection of domestic politics with foreign policy, and specifically Israel-Palestine. And so really, it's incumbent on all of us to do whatever we can to send our own signaling back to them, that if you dare to stand by our communities and our values, you will be protected. We would love to get money out of politics and get rid of super PACs. But until that happens, that's the only way to do it. Right? Now, we would love to see the Democratic Party and its leadership send its own signaling as well that they do not tolerate this and to stand by these men and women of color who are in Congress, who are speaking their convictions, and to tell APACs and the MFIs of the world to back off, and to tell other Democrats in Congress who are trafficking in this that this is unacceptable and does not represent the values of the Democratic Party. Because the future of the Democratic Party absolutely is not happy with what they're seeing. And as a congressman said, it's going to affect turnout in this cycle and future cycles as long as this behavior is allowed to continue. Um, one of the questions also is when can we see that APAC, the Friends of the IDF, this other group that you mentioned, the, register as a foreign agent because they're representing a foreign country uh, and they're punishing U.S. members of Congress based on their record of a foreign country that no other country has this kind of privilege. So when, when can we see them register as foreign agents? Who wants to take that one on? <laughs> I, I don't agree with Look, I think American citizens have the right to advocate for policy. What I think we need to do is get rid of the Correct. super PAC spending. I mean, if, right. if you want to be, if you're Indian American and you want to say if, if, if you're for uh, America having some role with, with, with India, or you're Chinese American or you're Jewish American, Muslim American, that's your right under this country. And you can, but what I, what I think is distortive is when you not only get a vote, you not only get to give uh, up to $3,300 to candidates, but you have super PACs where you have one or two individuals giving yeah. millions of dollars yeah. uh, in these races. And, uh, and, and that's being exploited by uh, many groups, and that's where the Democratic Party needs to come in and say, not in our primaries. Yeah. If I may, I mean, just expanding a bit beyond that, because yeah. I, I take your point about APAC being funded by American citizens. There was a report today in the New York Times and Haaretz uh, that the Israeli Ministry of Diaspora has been funding a covert program to target members of Congress with propaganda through their social media feeds, mm -hmm. focused particularly on African-American Democrats, including Leader Jeffries uh, and others. Um, that does seem like a foreign government effort to influence an election of the type that the you know, uh, FBI's Foreign Influence Task Force specifically was stood up to create in the context mm. of Russia. Uh, mm. So is that something that the FBI should be looking at in the context of foreign influence? Uh, and, you know, how would you respond to that, if I may? Well, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I think that there is a very serious uh, 
report, and uh, there should be zero tolerance for uh, foreign interference, and, and, and our law enforcement should be looking into uh, any effort to, uh, to, to have that kind of uh, influence on uh, American uh, elected officials, and certainly that kind of propaganda. I've been, the only time I, and this is not, there's nothing wrong with this, that part should be investigated by law enforcement, but I've had the, the Council General of Israel uh, argue with me on Twitter, <laughs> and I, I said, this is not going to win you any favors. One, your following is far lower than mine. Uh, <laughs> and secondly, you know, the, the, our, our country is far more powerful. Uh, you know, it's just not a long-term stra strategy, but but certainly. If I can add, um, on the intersection of the, the domestic and international response and how Muslims in the U.S. and Muslims overseas are impacted by our perception of human rights, our approach to human rights and foreign policy, I think, um, you know, Muslims in the U.S. have a vote, and so as dismayed as they are with the approach of the administration in, a, in, uh, in this conflict specifically, it has pushed them to organize more and organize better. Um, as we saw in the earlier panels, our, our polling and other studies show that when Muslim communities um, and minorities are targeted, they actually, it, it encourages them to get more involved in politics and get in more involved in their communities and in civic engagement. So. You know, it, it, it makes a difference. Um, the, what what what's in the power of people outside of the U.S. who are directly impacted by our policies are you know economic boycotts, um, you know shifting towards China. But within the U.S., Muslims have a vote; they have a place here. And as long as they are able to emphasize that, they're going to organize and they're thinking long term, um, not not just you know maybe not able to impact the course of uh, this conflict, but they're thinking ahead. And, and that's important. Thank you. Uh, back to the issue of counterterrorism. Uh, there, there's a point that Modi is looking uh, to learn from Netanyahu and, and doing the same thing uh, in the subcontinent. Uh, the Chinese government does to the Uyghurs uh, the same thing in the name of counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. um, this is all singling Muslims out. Uh, there's a concern that in this uh, uh, onslaught of Gaza, and talk about national security, we're going to bring back uh, programs like countering violent extremism to evaluate whether Muslims are, you know, to securitize Muslims, whether they are uh, good Muslims or bad Muslims, and the Muslim ban uh, may, may come up again if Trump uh, becomes uh, president. So um, how do we alleviate or quell the concerns of Muslims who distrust government because of American national security policy, um, and what is the strategy to to charging the na narrative, changing the narrative uh, uh, on national security strategy and its negative impact on Muslims? Such an easy question. Yeah, you can end with that. Um, you can just. We'll go through this. Yeah, look. Yeah, I can get you another question. Yeah, no, this. So, <laughs> so I think we should be very concerned. And irrespective of what your views, you should be extremely concerned um, um, if Donald Trump is elected. Believe what he has said he will do. Um, that is not justifying or uh, normalizing or even advocating on behalf of the other side. I'm just exp telling you how it is. So how do you fix this? Um, we must acknowledge that what China and Modi and others have been doing is the byproduct of our post-9-11 policies and not Gaza. Gaza is the byproduct of our 9-11 post 9-11 policies, in fact, because the team that is leading the administration's response is a post 9-11 team and its mentality and view regarding the Arab world. They're not looking at a historical fight between two people over a piece of land or whatever you want to call it. They're looking at a counterterrorism operation. So their prescriptions have been Mosul and Raqqa and not Gaza to devastating effects. So I, I'm going to bring it back to the beginning. People, representation. How do we do that? Engagements, advocacy, voting, lobbying, supporting the right kind of candidates, perseverance, iterate on it. What's happening right now specifically, uh, and here I'm going to get a little bit partisan, there, there's a misconception that 
Democrats failed us, Republicans failed us, we're out. My view, there's a fight within the Democratic Party for the values and the future of the party. So if that's the case, do we leave or do we double down? And the same needs to happen on the other side, by the way. Again, and a third way. All good. But there's been a big investment by this community over the last 20 years in the Democratic Party. Run for office, be in campaigns, contribute to it, organize for it, be in its administrations. Again, I'll repeat myself one more time. The same needs to happen within the Republican Party and independent parties. Because Islam should not be a partisan issue. Neither our future. And so, and so that is, that is my, the prescription. Is this community its allies doubling down, fighting like hell? Fighting like hell for the values and the actions of this party for years to come. Well, I think Islam should not be a policy issue either. No. And, and they, they, but you know, they, since they, the Inquisition, it has been, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, is it, I think a lot of people <laughs> are asking, when are we going to get over that? Um, we're we're going to just go ahead and Anyways. down the road and, and provide you time for closing comments. I'll address some of the, the uh, issues raised in the question. You know, Donald Trump first ran not as a Republican. He ran in the Reform mm -hmm. Party, and he lost. And then he decided it'd be better to just take over the Republican Party, and he has. Well, if Donald Trump can take over the Republican Party, there's no reason progressives can't take over the Democratic Party. Yes. That is the most practical way to gaining political power. Correct. And uh, what I would say to young people uh, and others is, uh, you know, you, you're, you have a, an extraordinary ability to mobilize on uh, social media, to build a movement, to be active in key states like Michigan. I mean, the presidency goes through Michigan, both for the nomination and for the general election, uh, and to, have, to change the calculus. And you already are. I mean, you've seen how much President Biden has shifted from uh, you know, uh, uh, October, uh, October to now. Uh, I'm not saying that he hasn't been moved by, uh, uh, by moral considerations, but all politicians are complex and political considerations play a role. And, and, and he has seen the, uh, and probably uh, was surprised uh, by the uh, mobilization of, uh, of, of not just Arab and Muslim Americans, but also young people, mm -hmm. people of color on this issue. And I think we're at the, the cusp of uh, having dramatic change. I believe that, I'll talk about India and China as well, but I believe the most dramatic thing the United States could do in signaling to the world and the larger Muslim uh, global community is to recognize yeah. a Palestinian state bilaterally and at the United Nations and to repeal the 1990 law that doesn't allow us to fund the United Nations if the United Nations recognizes a Palestinian state. I think that would be such a statement of moral clarity if we did that, that it would buy us goodwill in then working towards uh, solutions for peace uh, in the area. On Modi, uh, you know, I have uh, supported the U.S.-India relationship, but also been very critical of his reversing uh, Gandhi and Nehru's ideals of pluralism. My grandfather was uh, in jail for, uh, for four years alongside Gandhi and the Indian independence movement and was in the Congress party. Uh, so it has pained me personally to see the erosion uh, of those ideals. When I was in India, uh, I met not only with uh, the prime minister and foreign minister, but I also met with Indian Muslims uh, uh, in Haryana who had had their homes destroyed and with uh, Gandhi's great grandson and dissidents. One encouraging thing is that Modi uh, actually uh, did not have the convincing victory that he yeah. thought, and the opposition parties uh, won uh, a huge number of seats. And so there, too, in India, uh, and with us continuing to speak out for human rights, you can see new uh, political movements uh, emerging, challenging uh, questions that are, uh, are engaged in, in not recognizing uh, pluralism. And same with, with, with China, of course, political Participation there is harder, but we need to speak out very clearly uh, against uh, what they're doing to the Uyghurs and uh, have sanctions. But I'll end with just this point of that, that you know, that don't underestimate 
uh, your power and ability uh, to uh, bring change. And that is ultimately what brings change in America. Uh, it's not policy papers. It's not philosophical enlightenment. It is, uh, it is the mobilization of people. And that, that is what uh, all of you have an ability to do. Thank you. I, I want to go back to the question that was asked about young people entering, you know, um, being, should we, should we resign? I think that we're in a moment where we need diverse voices. We need you all to be, and this is a very young audience here, um, we need you yeah. to be uh, experts in policy, sure. and we need you to diversify the rooms where decisions are made that directly impact us and our communities locally and abroad. So um, it's, it's more important than ever that we become really good at this and that we lean into this effort uh, because we, our faith drives our respect for human rights and that's one way we can continue to have an impact um, on, on, the, on communities in the U.S. and abroad. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I would just say that I think that, uh, you know, for me the issue of Palestine and Gaza is certainly important on its own basis, on the basis of the rights of the Palestinians for self-determination, uh, and on stopping the horrors that are happening to them and that America is not just standing by but is actively complicit in. But it's also important to me in the context of American domestic politics mm -hmm. because I feel like what we are seeing in the response to this, uh, in the crackdown on college campuses, in the attempts to legislate what people can and cannot say, um, is, is really a sort of a canary in the coal mine uh, and that you know, this sets precedence. And if this carries through, if these laws pass, if these crackdowns succeed, uh, the Muslim voice will not be the last voice that these crackdowns come for. The Palestinian cause will not be the last cause that they come for. And so I actually you know, look at all of you, and I see you as standing really on the front lines of American freedom and American democracy. And, and you know, whether by choice or you know, on the back end of decades of discrimination, um, or not by choice, but, but really as, as the heroes of this moment. Uh, and I'm sorry that that is your burden to carry in some ways for all of us in America. And it's one that you know, I know a lot of progressives and a lot of people across the country increasingly stand with you on. And I hope that by building those alliances and by strengthening uh, those efforts that we can stop this in its tracks, turn it around, and shift things not only in terms of American foreign policy, uh, but also in terms of the direction this country is going in. Thank you. Let's give our ha hand for uh, the panelists. Excellent conversation.